I want to call your attention. You have at your places the report itself. Uh, don't read it or try to read it uh, as we gather uh, here now. But you'll see a listing of the subcommittee. Uh, Charlie referred to it. The sub we, that's our that's CED terminology. It's the task force, if you will, that is working on this post-secondary boosting productivity and post-secondary education. And it really was a dream team. Business executives on the one hand and college presidents on the other and all in between. So they contributed a great deal and the report would not have gotten writ written without the knowledge and skill of Pat Callan, who will be joining us here a little later, the uh, president of the National Center for Public Policy and Higher Education. What I'd like to do in my f very few minutes is tack some propositions to the church door. That is to say, I have no expectation that we will be leading to the Reformation but we are going to be putting some propositions in front of this country, business executives and legislators, that we think it's very important for them to know about and debate, and I would like to try to summarize those quickly for you. And I'll state them just as propositions. There's backing in the report for each of these kinds of propositions. Number one, you've heard it. But education and training beyond high school is a necessity, underlined, necessity for well-paying jobs now and in the future. Number two, in the second half of the 20th century, the United States was the world leader in educational attainment of our labor force. But three, with the retirement of the at least relatively well-educated baby boomers, and the rising levels of education outside of our borders, as Jeff said, we are losing our competitive edge in education. Four, even in domestic terms, forget world global engagement, the skills gap which Jeff referred to and demonstrates the real knowledge of means that, that we are in the future going to have millions of workers. That gap is millions of workers, not a few thousand. And so scaling is the name of the game. And compounding the gap issue are three other factors, none of them surprising. First, the rising proportion of racial and ethnic, ethnic minorities as part of our labor force now and in the future who historically have experienced significantly lower levels of educational attainment for a whole variety of reasons, but it's a fact. Second, associated with that to some extent, the level of poverty and economic disadvantage among those in our workforce of the future is going to be more of a challenge rather than less of a challenge. And third, the lasting effects, or at least persistent effects, of the Great Recession, and even more, the structural indebtedness of families, of governments, of the federal government, are eroding our ability to pay ever-rising tuitions and fees for post-secondary education. Those are the three factors, changing composition of the workforce, impoverishment of segments of the workforce, and the lasting effects of indebtedness. You can think about um, education loans, but it goes obviously far beyond that. So the enormous task of preparing the workforce for the future is going to require all segments of the post-secondary team, from research universities to technical schools. But the greatest burden, as you have heard from my pre preceding speakers, and the challenge is going to fall upon the broad access institutions, who are the trainers of today's workforce and, in particular, adult learners, in particular, where they earn their skills, their training, their degrees, and their certificates. This broad access universe 
is the backbone of the nation's workforce development system. Yet, it receives proportionately less support than the more prestigious and flagship universities. Not that this report in any way diminishes the need for those flagships, but in terms of need for training of the workforce, it will, it will not happen just in the flagships. It has to happen everywhere. And it's up to CED, and that's what we are trying to do today, kicking it off, to highlight this imbalance, this imbalance between the needs of the workforce and the resources available to the broad access institutions and to bring the business community to become engaged advocates on behalf of these broad access institutions. Okay, all fine. How, how are we gonna do this? First, do no harm. Uh, because of the diversity of the needs in post-secondary education, of the institutional capabilities for delivering those needs, and because different states, different institutions are at very different places in their life cycle of starting, there is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all solution. You will not find in this report what must be done. What we are talking about is what must start to happen to find what must be done. We are giving not even best cases because there are, they are still to be proven, but we are giving examples of innovative decisions and processes in state after state that are having an effect of innovation and on productivity. If we're talking about broad access institutions as we are, then we are talking primarily about state officials, governors, legislators, who control both the regulations and the purse strings of that affect those public institutions. And that's why we are saying to the business executives that we hope to engage, talk to your state officials, bring, make sure that they understand the nature of this problem and show them some examples if they ask. The paramount goal, the paramount goal and the potential contribution of the business community in post-secondary education is to help the states achieve transformational change in two things, productivity and effectiveness. Never use one word without the other. Productivity and effectiveness. They are essential partners. We can't do one without the other. The emphasis to an increasing degree is, needs to be on measurable outcomes. Do we know how to measure the output of colleges, universities? Not very well. We don't even know how to specify and shouldn't specify for any given institution what the inputs should be. But we must start measuring outcomes rather than seat time. This will require an openness to and an encouragement of innovation and, as Charlie mentioned, potentially disruptive innovation and a recognition that innovation is already occurring. It's not as though we don't have examples of innovation in the post-secondary field. Some of them are cited in this report. So that's really the essence of why CED today is opening the gates for a recruitment drive for business executives to talk with state officials about broad access institutions and productivity, increasing productivity and effectiveness. And I will not take the time now, you can read it. We have very specific processes that business executives can use in talking with and questions to ask state officials, like, for example, explicit state goals on the number of degrees, the kinds of institutions that will deliver those degrees, and the costs, and the costs of those degrees, and so on down the line. We have six recommendations that, uh, as to process with respect to state officials. 
I would be remiss if I didn't finish by saying two things that we expect and believe that business executives should ask not state officials, but themselves. Two things. <clears throat> Are we doing all that we can as business executives in our training programs to identify cost-effective delivery systems for knowledge, skill that we need among our workforce. This is an uncomfortable challenge. It's the same kind of challenge that business executives are facing in the medical or health delivery field. Who are the cost-effective, qualified providers? And the same is true in the education space. That's something that business executives will not find comfortable, but they owe it to their employees to try to guide them in that respect. And secondly, uh, they need to assist their own workforce in the completion of un uncompleted degrees and certificates. There are 37 million Americans, we believe, who have started down the path of certificates and degrees who have not achieved them. That's a huge resource. We cannot afford to waste that resource and business has a role itself in helping those people achieve that, uh, those degrees and certificates. That's it. You can read more about it. It's my task now, or my pleasure, to introduce the people who will be joining me on the platform. Would you please come up? Pat Callan, Marilyn Resnick, and Kathy Weil. I will introduce, you, introduce them as you come up, please. <laughs> 